Marines. Focused, well-trained. The primary fighting force of the UNSC, men and women of impeccable moral fibre and dedication to humanity. Marines are individually resilient and motivated. They are the braves of our species, led by rank after rank of noble, passionate and honourable commanding officers all the way up the rank and file. They are often the first military presence the civilians will see in times of trouble. When colonies were mercilessly attacked by the Covenant, it was the Marines who held the line until the masses had evacuated. They would stand and fight for as long as they were able to, to assure the clear passage of civilians to bastions of safety. The training, the discipline, the character traits, the abundance of honour and strength in the face of adversity has not changed. But their equipment has. Over the centuries of evolution from the first companies of Marine Commandos all the way to the UNSC Marine Corps of the 26th century, the Marines have always been trained to be elite soldiers, but the equipment they utilise to perform their duties has changed and morphed over the years to remain relevant and effective in the theatre of war. The Marines turned into the fighting force we see today as time, trial and technology advanced, as combat evolved. In the 26th century, as in the modern era, the Marines are instantly recognisable. Their no-nonsense attitude, their honour, bravery, dedication to duty shine through their external appearance. However, on the battlefield there is one surefire way to spot a Marine, and that is by the Marine battle dress uniform they all wear turning these individuals of honour and duty into a singular united force of strength and power. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and today we give the Marine Battle Dress Uniform the most detailed treatment. As with previous most detailed breakdowns of armour, we will work from the outside in, analysing every layer and component as we go. As I say in all of my most detailed breakdowns, the law regarding the Marine BDU is substantial but there are some areas where information is sparse. As such, in these situations I will endeavour to apply known principles of science, technology and material science to hopefully bring greater understanding of just what would be necessary to achieve whichever result I am detailing at the time. As such, although I will stick as close to the law as possible, in these particular situations I will have to stray from the law but I do so with known principles of science in the spirit of furthering our collective understanding of the technologies at play. With that being said, let's get started. As stated by its name, the Marine Corps Battle Dress Uniform or BDU is a uniform worn by the Marines during combat operations. There are various permutations of the BDU in service with the UNSC Marine Corps, but all constituent variants comprise of a set of hard armour plating over a set of camouflaged combat fatigues and a helmet with built-in electronic suite. The BDU appears to be manufactured by Misria Armoury, while it is known that a good deal of the early and iterative development of the BDU was conducted by Ushuaia Armoury, with Misria Armoury being responsible for the mass production of the finished product. The earliest versions of what can be considered the standard Marine Corps BDU entered service early on during the insurrection, meaning it entered service at some point around the turn of the 26th century between 2495 and 2525. It is unclear exactly when. This variant proved effective and reliable and despite being very lightweight it proved to be very resilient against damage. The design gives extensive protection to the wearer above and beyond what our current modern combat BDUs provide our current real-world militaries, but it's by no means a perfect system. The armour still has some vulnerabilities and some pitfalls in its design which could be fixed with some relatively simple changes to its design. It's unclear exactly why this hasn't been done yet, but it is likely that the cost of the changes likely outweighs the benefit the changes would have to the end user. While I don't agree with this ethos in the slightest, it does appear that a soldier's life does have a limit on the value the UNSC are willing to spend. Disgusting when you think about it, but also an unfortunate reality of war. To quote a personal hero of mine, The encounters didn't think a soldier's life was worth 300 grand. While we're on the subject of Batman, if you're not already, head over to my second channel, Lawcore Multiverse, where I'm branching out and giving other franchises the most detailed treatment. 
What does Batman have to do with that? Well, his suit's pretty cool, isn't it? I'll let you figure out what I'm getting at. Might not be the only billionaire comic book hero I'll be looking at either. The armor plating of the BDU covers the torso, shoulders, shin, forearms and outer thighs at a minimum, with other variants providing more coverage. The armor is a composite armor plate, with a titanium outer plate and bonded layers of high density polymers and padding on the inner surface towards the body. The armor is very lightweight, but also very resilient. I realized upon researching for this video that I have never explicitly looked into the technique of creation that the UNSC employs for their armor plating, so I feel it's time to look into what technique is used, and why. And bearing in mind this applies not only to the Marine BDU, but also many of the other armor plating that is used, including the shipborne armor plating and Mjolnir itself. Just from the footage available in the Halo 3 Landfall live action, I came to the conclusion rather quickly that the vast majority of armor plating systems used across the entire UNSC, including the Marine BDU, is created by forging as opposed to machining or casting. Casting is where a metal is heated to a molten state and then is poured into a die. Casting is good for a complicated or complex part and is usually done in small production runs and tends to be more expensive than the tooling for machined parts. Machining takes a block of a material and machines it with cutting tools. This is much cheaper but it takes longer to have a finished component versus casting depending of course on the parts complexity. Further to this, the very act of cutting creates large volumes of scrap material which is ultimately just waste. Even when processes such as lean manufacturing are employed, the reductive process of machining results in high waste, as opposed to both casting and forging. Part surface integrity and strength is also a consideration. When machining, the tool cuts material away from a block. This means that the microscopic grain structure of the metal is interrupted by the cut leaving individual grains open at the surface of the material, presenting a discrepancy in the surface integrity that can lead to weakness and part failure. The process I believe the UNSC uses for their armour is forging, where a material is heated but kept solid and then moulded to a given shape by high pressure forging dies. Forging offers uniformity of composition and structure and results in metallurgical recrystallization and grain refinement as a result of the thermal cycle and deformation process. This strengthens the resulting product, particularly in the terms of impact and shear strength. Forging creates a part that is generally stronger and more reliable than casting and machined parts due to the fact that the grain flows of the material are altered, conforming to the shape of the part. This makes a part that is very, very tough. However, a couple of metal treatments are likely performed after forging which further add to the titanium alloy's properties and makes it more suitable for use as armor plating. For the BDU armor plates, this means that the titanium is alloyed with other materials first to attain the right alloy and thus the right properties for the given application, in this case, armor. No information is specifically given as to what exact alloy is used, however. It seems highly unlikely that the titanium used for this armor would be pure titanium, as first many of the characteristics of the armor in question don't align very well with pure titanium, and second, it doesn't appear that the UNSC uses pure titanium for practically anything else, other than to alloy it with other materials to create their signature titanium A alloy and other permutations of this alloy. In either case, the alloyed titanium ingot is then heated to a high enough temperature to make it malleable, but still solid. This causes the crystalline structure of the metal to break down. It is then formed into the desired shape by extremely high pressure forms. This basically just bends the material into the desired shape. As the now formed armor component cools, the grain structure in the metal recrystallizes. New grains form and grow resulting in fewer dislocations of the grain structure. This is the end of the forging process and now the armor plates are treated. It is then likely that the plates are normalized. Normalizing is applied to alloys to provide uniformity in grain size and composition. The metal is heated to a predefined temperature and then cooled by air. The resulting metal is free of undesirable impurities and exhibits greater strength and hardness. 
Normalizing is often used to produce a harder and stronger material, albeit one that is less ductile than that produced by annealing. After this, it is likely surface hardened. This is where the surface of the material is heated and then quenched in oil or water which rapidly cools it. This produces an alloy which has high strength and wear resistance but can also make it quite brittle. Doing this only to the surface ensures the surface of the plate is extra hard while the bulk of the plate maintains its ductility and toughness to withstand impact and shock loading as would be expected from bullet impacts. The result of all of this is that the armour plates of the BDU are very lightweight but also extraordinarily resilient against ballistic weapons. The armour can take most rounds except for multiple high velocity armour piercing rounds. If I had to put a nidge rating on the marine BDU, I'd personally give it a nidge level 3. This means that the plate is designed to stop 6 spaced hits from a 7.62 by 51mm NATO full metal jacket at a velocity of around about 2,780 feet per second. This is one of the most common rounds both in real life and in the Halo universe. The reason I chose this niche level as opposed to say a level 4 is simply because the level 3 is tested against 6 rounds where the level 4 is tested to take only a single 7.62 armor piercing high velocity round travelling at nearly 2880 feet per second. Since level 4 ballistic plates are only tested to stop one shot compared to 6 shots for a level 3 plate, a level 4 plate is not always better than a level 3. There is a level 3 plus which denotes that it can take the same rounds at higher velocity or protect against other threats as well as the 6 shots, but I didn't choose this one simply because the level 3 plus isn't recognised by the actual niche authoritative body. It may be by the 26th century, but right now I'd rather stick to my guns, so to speak. The armour plates of the BDU can also be affixed with various additional attachments such as ammunition pouches and utility pockets. The armour plates have also been witnessed to be up-armoured by peripheral armour plates. The most widely seen is the UANXRA which stands for Up-Armoured Non-Explosive Reactive Armour. This armour plate is often seen attached to the thigh. It is basically two armoured plates separated by a silicone spacer. The two plates are given an electromagnetic charge. The damage to the exterior of the armour passes electricity into the plates, causing them to magnetically move together. As the process is completed at the speed of electricity, the plates are moving when they are physically struck by the projectile, causing the projectile to be deflected, while the energy is also dissipated in parting the magnetically attracted plates. The BDU also contains a few electromagnetic holster strips for weapons. As evidenced by Sergeant Johnson, one is between the shoulder blades. Johnson holsters his battle rifle here. It would appear that the armour contains a reactive system possibly linked to a gesture controlled system or even the standard neural interface of all marines uh, enlistment. It could be that the very act of Johnson reaching for his battle rifle triggered sensors in the fatigues of his BDU which caused the magnetic holster strip to deploy in an upward direction, presenting the grip of his rifle to a retrievable position above his shoulder, or that he simply thought about grabbing his rifle and an intuitive neurally linked system recognised this and did it for him. I am inclined to believe the gesture controlled system is more likely, as there doesn't appear to be a way for the BDU to interact with the user's neural interface. Usually I'd suggest the helmet has something to do with it, but Johnson isn't wearing a helmet in this scene. Nevertheless, the BDU has the magnetic strips that holster weapons and retract them out of the way and redeploy them should the marine need it. A simple but very clever system which is great to see in action. It is worth noting however that the nature of the armour plates being solid and uncovered as they are does mean that a risk of injury as a consequence of spool is a legitimate concern. When a bullet strikes the plate it is possible that small pieces of the bullet and the armour itself could break away and deflect. If such a piece deflects from an impact on the chest and travels upward, this high velocity spool can cause significant injury or death if it struck the user underneath the chin, for example. The armour plating and soft armour fatigues protect the wearer practically everywhere else, however this one vulnerable area is left. It could be somewhat solved by installing a collar on the front of the chest armour that would redirect spool away from the face and deflect it away from the user, however I have yet to see any such system implemented. On top of this, the armour plates perform quite poorly 
against directed energy weapons often being heated or melted completely by the intense heat. Newer models have made use of a similar crystalline refractive coating that is used on Mjolnir, but even this has its limits. Overall, the armour plating of the Marine BDU is impressively resilient, lightweight and extremely effective at protecting the wearer's vital organs, which is ultimately what you want from armour plating. The CH-252 helmet is made of a composite armour plating with layers of padding and an internal electronic suite. It can be outfitted with a heads-up display eyepiece or ballistic goggles that can be polarised either orange or black, as well as a boom microphone and a tactical flashlight. The helmet can be fitted with an accessory clip which can be used to mount a night vision device. The basic army configuration of the helmet features a chin strap though this is typically not worn by the marines. Balaclavas are often worn with the helmet especially when operating in cold environments though they are occasionally worn in temperate and desert climates. The electronic suite controls the heads-up display and links via a smart link system to the user's weapon, allowing a targeting reticle to be projected onto the HUD assisting the user with their aim. It also contains a communication suite allowing for conversation between the squad, a command uplink is usually available for squad leaders to communicate with their superiors and so on. The helmet also relays the Marine's IFF transponder signal. Within the neural implant of all UNSC Marines is an identification friend or foe system. This contains basic identification information and encrypted codes that are broadcast over a large area, enabling other marines in the area to see waypoint markers showing where other members of their squad are in three-dimensional space at a glance, while also allowing motion tracking systems to combine information from the motion detector and local IFFs to display allies on the motion tracker, thereby meaning through basic reductive reasoning that any other moving targets are likely to be foes. The helmet also contains a mission camera which records to an internally enclosed storage medium. This is apparently a universal storage medium which can be removed and inserted into either other marine helmets or even a Mjolnir helmet as we see Master Chief do in Halo CE. This camera records the mission from the marine's point of view and enables intelligence officers to gather information on the mission as well as analyse how the operation went and in situations of misconduct the footage can be reviewed to see if the marine or other marines in the area acted in accordance to established laws of war. The ECH-252 is an enclosed variant of the standard CH-252 helmet. The helmet can be fully enclosed and environmentally sealed featuring a polarised or unpolarised visor based on the preferences of the user, which is also the basis of the Beta 5's division's military police helmet which is a shared asset among the branches of the UNSC armed forces. This helmet can also be used in conjunction with Mjolnir armour. This version can be used with vacuum suits during extravehicular activity as well as being utilised during terrestrial combat as part of the Marine Corps' atmospheric and exoatmospheric BDU and is also the standard issue for the Army's UH-144 Falcon and YSS-1000 Sabre pilots. A variation of the CH-252 helmet was worn by officers of the New Mombasa Police Department. This version features a large blast shield to protect the wearer from small arms fire and presumably from shrapnel and secondary explosions. Like its military counterparts, the NMPD's version of the CH-252 could mount a boom microphone. You can ask practically any marine and they will tell you that one of the most valuable pieces of equipment that they have are a comfortable pair of combat boots and socks. It is absolutely no different for a 26th century marine. The VZG7 boots appear to be standard lace-up combat boots covered in varying types of armour. The armour attached to the boots covers the upper part of the shin from all sides. The boot itself is covered in light armour plating. In the later versions, the metallic armour covering the upper shin appears to be separate from the boot and does not cover the back of the leg. Armoured coverings attached by straps are often worn on the boots for greater protection. The boots have impressive grip and traction even on the slickest of surfaces, and most marines of the UNSC Marine Corps agree that the boots are very comfortable. It stands to reason then that technology of footwear has advanced somewhat, massively reducing the chances of blisters on boots that are relatively new to the wearer. The exact mechanism about how this is achieved is unknown, but given the advancement of material science and other technologies, I would wager that hydrogel probably has something to do with it. Ultimately, if a marine's feet are comfortable, they can march all day and kick ass all night.
UNSC fatigues are typically a multi-layer of aramid fibres such as Kevlar impregnated with shear thickening fluid or liquid dilatant armour. This means that just three layers of Kevlar provides the same ballistics protection as 15 layers of untreated Kevlar. While it will stop small arms fire, it will cause excruciating pain due to blunt force trauma. There are also likely layers of high strength materials and waterproof treatments. The fatigues include a camouflage to allow the wearer to blend into their environments. Camouflage patterns utilised by the UNSC include grey urban colour, a mottled green jungle or forest camouflage, a light grey and white snow camouflage, and a desert pattern. UNSC Air Force pilots wear fatigues with a maritime blue camouflage pattern, while not nearly as effective as Covenant Active Camouflage or the photoreactive panels on the semi-powered infiltration armour used by the Spartan 3s, it provides users with a basic level of concealment from enemy forces. Fatigues are worn on missions where the added protection of heavier armour is a disadvantage, such as difficult terrain or stealth missions, as the clattering of armour may alert enemies in the area of the location of the marines. On top of this, the weight and bulkiness may inhibit the wearer's movement and performance. Due to the fatigues being made of soft materials rather than heavy armour plating, fatigues provide little protection from Covenant-directed energy weapons, which can melt and burn through most materials it comes into contact with. The earliest known iteration of the Marine Corps BDU was in use during the insurrection and continued to see service well into the Human Covenant War, with some units fielding this model as late as 2559 in the Second Art Conflict in the post-war era due to cryosleep. Notably, this model was standard issue during the Harvest Campaign and saw extensive use during the early stages of the Battle of Earth. The fatigues have a two-tone greenish-grey camouflage, whereas the armour is issued in both reflective drab and matte forest green. The cold environment fatigues used the same camouflage pattern with white in places of green. Similarly coloured armour and a matching helmet are worn with this version. The shoulder pauldrons of this model came in at least two designs, the standard version being a broad concave form that covers the shoulder and most of the upper arm, while an offhand variant is thicker and sits higher on the arm, extending well beyond the shoulder. Marines with this variant often wear polarised tactical goggles and balaclavas, even in temperate environments. The chest piece used with this model is composed of very heavy armour plating. The forearm, shins and boots are fully armoured, some users wear tactical thigh rigs and holsters, while some wear armour covering their thighs. Often the left thigh is armoured while a holster is attached to the right thigh. The M52B Variant 1 is the first version of the M52B body armour, as it was worn by Marines in 2552 during the earlier stages of the Battle of Mombasa as well as the Battle of Cleveland, and consists of a chest plate and back plate assembly with a supplemental abdominal plate and linked lower back plate that collectively maximises torso coverage. The chest, abdominal and lower back plates are frequently affixed with varying configurations of pouches. The chest plate and back plate themselves are distinguished by their relatively square overall shape and the shallow, shaped cutouts over its surface. The chest plate reaches up to either side of the wearer's collar and entirely over the wearer's trapezius in order to connect with the back plate, lacking prominent buckles or straps. The abdomen plate links with the lower back plate around the wearer's side in a similar manner. This version of the M52B does not feature any kind of vest layer between the plating and the wearer's uniform and lacks integrated pauldrons, though separate pauldrons are typically worn with it with their own distinct shaping system, and the plating assemblies do feature a secondary, inward-facing material layer. The M52B Variant 2 is the second version of the M52B armour, which weighs 14.5 pounds or 6.58 kilograms and features a heavy chest plate with a layered surface and characteristic buckled straps running over the user's trapezius to secure it against the back plate, along with connectors under the arms. An additional buckle is located centrally on the bottom of the chest plate and the chest plate and back plate are worn over a vest of flexible black material which covers the entire torso and runs partially down the upper arms. The arm coverage of the vest extends only over the outward facing portion of the arm, is strapped over the underside and features integrated pauldron assemblies. This version of the M52B features a prominent protective collar around the side and back of the neck. It lacks an abdominal plate, instead sporting a raised brown-coloured patch of additional material over the stomach, which tapers into groin protection, and a flat-top discoloured plate at the bottom of the back with two attachment loops. 
This version of the battle dress uniform is shared with the Army and Air Force. It features grey fatigues with dust brown or grey brown armour plating covering the head, torso, shoulders, thighs and shins. At times, Marines wear only their utilities and soft body armour, even foregoing helmets and body armour plating in hazardous combat operations, sometimes substituting their helmets for boonie covers or bandanas. Some Marines have small medical packs built into their back armour plating. Many helmets worn with this system include a holographic tactical eyepiece. Marine pilots usually wear a modified version of the standard Marine uniform, though they are known to utilise the BDU without modifications as well. Several helmet models are used by pilots including one version with a fully covering flip-down visor which likely features a heads-up display. A similar model seen in use by Pelican pilots during the early stages of the Battle of Mombasa featured a larger gold polarised visor. Other pilots wear more advanced equipment including fully sealed helmets and an additional control panel on the standard chest armour piece. Each helmet bears a wing symbol, possibly denoting the wearer's MOS, or Military Occupational Specialty. The vacuum suits generally used by UNSC pilots and infantry during space operations are based upon the universal BDUs used by the UNSC Marines, Army and Air Force. Though identical in outward appearance to regular combat BDUs, these suits incorporate a fully pressurised bodysuit and a vacuum rated ECH-252 combat helmet. The variant worn by UNSC pilots is minimally armoured, while the AX combat suit used by Marines features heavy armour plating. The suit possesses no EVA thrusters by default but are compatible with EVA gear. Pilot issued versions of these vacuum suits were used by the YSS-1000 Sabre crews who boarded the Covenant Corvette Ardent Prayer during Operation Uppercut. Personnel working aboard UNSC refit stations such as Anchor 9 also used similar vacuum suits. Marine issue vacuum suits were used by Sergeant Johnson and his squad as they neutralised the unsecured data of the UNSC circumference in orbit above reach. Vacuum combat suits are also used during atmospheric missions where atmospheric hazards such as nearby glassings are present. This was seen during the Battle of Azod where UNSC Marines assigned to the UNSC Pillar of Autumn used vacuum combat suits. A model of the vacuum suit that was used by UNSC Marines in the early years of the war was more clearly distinct from ground-based BDUs featuring a green full bodysuit with olive drab armour plates and a helmet equipped with a HUD and COM system. They were used by teams sent to clear the NAV database of the UNSC Prophecy during the Harvest Campaign in 2531. Bulky black vacuum suits with compartmentalised design and self-sealing foam injectors were used by Staff Sergeant Johnson and Brine during humanity's first combat encounter with the Covenant in 2525. A newer version of the BDU entered widespread use after the end of the Human Covenant War, seemingly based on a similar model which saw service as early as 2526 with the cadets of the Marine Garrison of the Corbulo Academy of Military Science. This model shared many features with the post-war BDU, namely a similar ballistic vest and two-colour motif in the trousers with the insides being either black or khaki brown. While the general arrangement of the post-war BDU's armour sections remain largely similar to the prior variations, a new more prominent ballistic vest has been adopted as an additional defensive measure beneath the plating. Elements of previous BDUs are also incorporated, including what appear to be several updated models of the CH-252 helmet, as well as a new variation of the VZG-7 armoured boots. As with the other generations of the BDU, there are several configurations of armour worn over the BDU which consist of several configurations for infantry, officers and corpsmen, a variation worn by almost all marines on duty aboard Infinity, possibly a designated security or shipborne configuration, includes a larger, bulkier helmet worn with a basic ballistic vest, armoured boots and shoulder pieces. This variant is also seen in either completely red or blue colours in wargame simulations. The standard issue version worn by marines engaged in ground operations designated infantry varies slightly and includes one of two models of helmet, one of which bears similarity to the wartime variant of the CH-252 worn with the cross branch BDU, the other of which is referred to as an off-world helmet, with either an array of tactical pouches or an armour piece on the chest. A variant designated Heavy Infantry has notably up-armoured chest armour plating and a full-face helmet with a white face mask and green-tinted visor. 
The variation shares many traits with the armour worn by NCOs in the field, which combines the up-armoured chest piece with an armoured collar on the left side of the neck, similar to that worn by post-naval officers, and an insignia-bearing cap. The armour worn by Corman is fully white, with red detailing and a considerable amount of tactical pouches to contain medical supplies. Marine communication specialists wear their comms units on their backs with the standard infantry BDU. The post-war BDU also has a considerable number of accessories to be worn with it. These include wrist-mounted displays, tactical goggles, thigh and shoulder plates, combat knife sheaths and helmet attachments. The fatigues worn beneath the ballistic vest and armour are characterised by their twin tone coloration, in addition to the primary colour. The uniform has reddish brown sections on the inner portion of the legs, the neck, the upper part of the sleeves and the sides of the torso. The primary colour of the uniform is commonly olive drab, although grey variants are also widely seen, notably on Corman. The armour and helmet itself is either olive drab, khaki or white, depending on the user's requirements. The Marine BDU has served the Marine Corps well for over 30 years and in truth likely much longer than this. While not as powerful as Mjolnir or as protective as the ODST BDU, the Marine BDU offers a Marine ballistics protection over much larger areas of the body than would otherwise be currently available whilst still being impressively light and still able to stop multiple high velocity rounds. The electronics grant the Marine better situational awareness and coordination with their squad as well as higher performance with their weapons. While the BDU is decidedly less impressive than Mjolnir, SPI or ODST armour, the importance of a reliable, effective and resilient armour solution for the beating heart of the UNSC military cannot be understated. As I previously said, although the suit has some minor drawbacks, if these were addressed and the budget allowed it, our modern day marines could be outfitted with this BDU as it is completely within our current ability to produce. The materials and technology utilised within the BDU are completely possible right now. Although our current real-world military-grade personal body armour is decent and has undoubtedly saved many lives over its tenure, it also has its limitations. I personally would love to see our brave men and women on the front line outfitted with armour systems much like the Marine BDU, which ultimately increase their chances of surviving and returning home to us safely. Make no mistake, the Marine BDU could do exactly that. So why aren't we funding this? Maybe it's high time I pull a finger out and put a proposal together. Get a crowdfunding page up and going and get the BDU made real. But then, if I'm going to do that, maybe I should be looking at the ODST armour or indeed Mjolnir. But that is for a future video. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons Neek the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stork of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, DW, Flaming Halo, and the Revanche, my holders of the mantle. All of these glorious reclaimers, my loyal Metarchs, and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome, and all of this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo Lord Discuss to Insane Loves of Detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels, including Discord. Be sure to pop over to my second channel, the Law Core Multiverse, and subscribe there for more most detailed breakdowns of stuff from other franchises. And if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.